today. And um, so I would like, if you guys would just kind of <coughs> names and how long you've been in business or with Keller, that would be fabulous, just very quickly. Start. I'm Jocelyn. Um, I started July 1st, so that's it for me. Billy Farrell started about two weeks ago here. Uh, Trey Dugo started about three months ago. Hey, Hedrick, three months ago. Yes. Um, I started on, I came over on Friday, but I've been in real estate 25 years. Excellent. Name? Oh, that would help. It. <laughs> I'm writing it. Uh, Linda Bobsky. Excellent. Uh, Lisa Smithers, I've been in business since 1990. I came to Keller Williams a long time ago, but they told me how to do all this stuff. And I didn't want to do all this stuff, and now they said I don't have to do it, but I want to, but I want to, so anyway, I'm excited to be here. Okay, cool. <laughs> uh, it's her fault, she brought that. <laughs> Lois Sims, I've been here for about two and a half months. Excellent, very good. And you came with a little bit of experience, didn't you? Yeah, yeah, I've been in the business for 10 years. Okay. Excellent. Very good. Okay. Well, I'm Carolyn Geiger. I've been with Keller Williams for 10 years and an agent for 10 years. I've been licensed a little longer uh, as a property management for a while. So I'm happy to be here with you guys. And I, we are videotaping today. Um, so be on your best behavior. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So does everybody have a handout? Yes. All right. Good. We're t um, just kind of talking about mortgages today and just kind of giving you a quick overview on different mortgage types, kind of the differences in between them, and some helpful tips on when you're working with buyers, sometimes the knowledge of having uh, first-time buyer grants or improvement loans and just kind of having some of that background may help you hook a buyer. It may not be the deal the buyer actually ends up doing as far as mortgage-wise, but that you have the knowledge and can guide them through the process is exactly what they're looking for. And they're looking for that advice and counsel and help. And so you don't have to be an expert at all of these mortgages. You just have to know that these mortgages exist and be able to use that when needed, okay? So you can kind of pull it out of your back pocket. All right, so the first thing we're going to talk about is kind of the difference between some of the mainstream mortgages, so conventional, FHA, USDA, and VA. And so I kind of liken it, this may be an extreme example, but I kind of liken conventional mortgages um, to being more privately owned and privately backed. There, there are definitely corporations, stocks, um, there are different sources for conventional lending, so to speak. Um, just to kind of dummy it down, I would look at it like Donald Trump has a gazillion bucks, and he wants to make some money on that money, and he wants to help the little people. So he might go to some local banks, he might uh, go to some big banks, he, and say, you know what, I'd like to make some mortgages for people, I'd like to make some extra money on my money, and so I'm looking for, you know, this type of person, this type of debt to income ratio. Like he can kind of dictate his terms as to how much he wants to lend and who he wants to lend it to. That would be a type of a condition of a conventional okay, mortgage. So Other banks are also going to acquire funds, sometimes from the government. Uh, they may loan them some money. Other banks may loan them money. Um, and those and all of that money is going to have some standards attached to it. Um, as far as what the credit criteria is, what the interest rate might be, what the private mortgage insurance uh, deal is. And so you'll see that conventional mortgages will sometimes, although they all typically have a 5% down minimum, there are sometimes programs or specials or deals where a particular investor might be willing to do a lesser percent down, take a risk on um, not maybe having as much mortgage insurance requirement, um, so that's why having a lot of different sources and lenders that do these mortgages, not every mortgage is exactly the same on the back end, and the sub may benefit the buyer better than others, okay? So that would be kind of the conventional is more like your private um, money. FHA um, is your public source. So this money comes backed from the U.S. government. 
So what happens is the government says, hey, we want to make money on our money. Really, that's our money, right? Because it's our tax dollars at work. Okay. So they're going to go out, make some loans for some people, promote home ownership. Um, they were very good at that in the uh, late 90s to early 2000s, right? And so they were helping a lot of people get, uh, get mortgages. And, um, and that's fine. Um, the difference between, really, the, the FHA and the government, or in a conventional, is that the government is kind of more one for all, right? So their criteria is very standardized. And FHA loans, um, they'll have a cheaper down payment, typically. So right now, that's a 3.5% down payment. With a conventional, we talked about that being 5%. And as long as you match the criteria, their base criteria, you everybody gets the same interest rate. With conventional, you might be able to gander a better interest rate if your debt-to-income is better, if your down payment is higher, if your salary is better, you can actually maybe gain a little more advantage in interest rate or have a little negotiating room. Now, FHA is government, and so there are going to be some requirements attached to this mortgage. The first one being that um, the condition of the house, they kind of want to have a say in it. And I will tell you that conventional mortgage is also kind of turning this way where they do kind of want to have a say on the condition of the house, although it's not as extreme as FHA. What's going to happen is FHA is going to require an appraisal that also checks for some base functionality in the house. So it's going to have to have running water. It's going to have to have working heater air conditioning. It's going to have to have a place to cook. It's going to have to have uh, secured windows and doors. It's going to have to have safety railings if there's a, a deck or a patio or, or a front porch stoop that you, know, you could fall off and hurt yourself. I think it's four foot. If it's higher than four feet, it requires a railing. Um, they're going to look in the attic. They're going to look at the condition of the roof. They're going to look at the condition of the foundation from an eyeball perspective. And the appraiser may actually ask you for something called appraisal requirements. So it will be, yes, we think the house is worth, you know, 200000 but we uh, question the roof, and so we want that checked out, and uh, there's no railing on the back deck. And so that will get written into the appraisal that unless these two things are, are okay, the appraisal is not going to come in. That kind of puts you in a pickle sometimes, especially when you represent the seller and there's extra requirements. Now, the buyer may be fine. Like, we have our Uncle Tom's a roofer. They want, we want them to replace it later. And, you know, we're fine with the railing. We don't have kids. We won't fall off. It doesn't matter. But if, if these are the requirements, then you're kind of stuck with that. The nice, bad, I don't know if it's nice or bad, thing about the FHA uh, appraisals is that if your deal falls apart because of, you know, the seller not wanting to cooperate with this, this appraisal actually gets registered with the address of the house, and now you're stuck with it three, six, six months, six months. So if another buyer comes a month later and makes an offer on the house, now this appraisal is tied to the house. If they're using FHA loan, this, this is still going to come up. So the, so the seller can only get out of this possibly if that next buyer goes conventional or pays cash. Okay, so when you're negotiating on behalf of a seller and you're representing the seller, a lot of times it's like, you know what, Mr. Seller, you know, we could disagree to do this, but if the next buyer is FHA, guess where we're going to be? Right back here. So why don't we go ahead and get that roof checked out? Let's get that railing put up because if you don't do it, somebody else is going to ask you. And if the roof is really questionable, a conventional appraiser might catch it anyway. Um, I've also had some foreclosures where if we couldn't get water on, uh, I could get an appraisal on it. So conventional is kind of starting to care as they're getting these houses or had been getting these houses back in the foreclosure uh, time period a couple of years ago that there was a lot of deals that were being made where the buyer and the seller would just say, oh, you know what, here, we'll just give you extra closing costs, or we'll just take a couple grand off the loan. Mr. Buyer, you put on the roof later. Well, then if the buyer didn't do that, then they foreclosed, 
now the bank made a deal based on that that roof was going to be replaced. Now it's not. Now it's even even more shape, and there's a mold issue, and there's settlement in the house, and now they've got this house they can't resell in foreclosure. So conventional mortgages are kind of starting to get a little tic tacky here and there. Not as bad, but it can still happen to you. Okay. So if you have a house that you know is in pretty rough shape and your buyer wants to do a conventional mortgage, have them talk to the bank officer about anything that might be, you know, is a known problem, and make sure that the underwriter is not going to have a cow about that, okay? All right, questions about any of this? Okay. All right, the next on the list is FHA with repair escrow. So it's basically the same deal as an FHA loan. But let's say, and I just like to keep things simple math, so I'm going to use $100,000. The price of the house is $100,000. And let's say it needs a little carpet. The appliances have been stolen or missing. And we need some new countertops in the bathroom because they're olive green. They're very ugly. And it might be about a total of you know ten grand to you know get some great appliances, replace the carpet throughout the home, and fix the bathrooms. So what the buyer can do is, if the anticipated value of that home would be 110, if everything were fixed and all the yucky stuff were taken care of, and we know we can get that appraisal, then your buyer can take the difference between the sales price and the future anticipated value, and then use that money to do those repairs. So then the buyer gets bids during your inspection periods typically, and gives those to the lender. The lender will approve those bids, and here's the caveat. The buyer cannot do any of these repairs themselves. It has to be a licensed contractor uh, with permits if needed, if permits are required. They're going to really make sure that, the, that everything is on the up and up. So it's not like your buyer can just get this money and then go to you know, Home Depot and install the carpet themselves. Yes. And don't they have to do a before <laughs> and after appraisal? Yes, they have to do a before and after appraisal and a before and after inspection. The interest rate is also going to be higher on this loan. So if standard interest rates are 4.2, this is probably going to be somewhere close to 5 or higher, just kind of depending on the buyer's ability. This money will sit in escrow. The title company and the lender will assist paying off these bills as they come in. The work has to be done within, I think, about two to three months. Yeah, and don't they have, aren't they allowed like three draws? You know, I have not gotten in. It's been so long since I've done one, to be honest with you, because I just go, don't do that. <laughs> That's pain in the butt. <laughs> um, but yeah, they, could, they, they have to take draws, and so they manage this money. So let's say at the end of this, they ended up getting a deal on the carpet, and they only ended up spending eight grand. Well, the difference will just get applied to the master loan as a payoff. So when it's all said and done, their mortgage would be 108 thousand dollars. They don't get to cash out this money and get it back or get it out. Okay. It's 108,000. So the costs are the additional interest, the additional inspections, and the appraisal, the reappraisal. So it's not always a good win for a buyer. By the time they end up spending a little bit of this money, unless the margin of value is really good, like this is a 150s neighborhood, we're picking up for 100, only needs 10 grand, and then it's probably worth the expense. Um, but if it's just a, you know, if you're, if you're playing with a margin this tight, it's probably not worth it. I would just encourage the buyer to just accept the property as it sits, and then just, you know, save up, do some of the work on their own, or pull a home equity line of credit out after they close, which is another option. Yes. Um, I do not know. I do not know. Um, I, I don't know if it goes with FHA standards, which in our area is about 275 is the maximum loan. I was thinking 280. 
Yeah, yeah, that's FHA standard. I don't know if the 203K has an additional cap or a limit on it. I do think the amount that you can borrow off of it is only, I think it's capped at 20 to 30 grand. So if you bought a $100,000 house that's worth 300 and it needs $100,000 for the work, this is not that low. So this is only for minor or mid-minor updates and upgrades. But if you've got a buyer that you know really wants a house and it's got horrible carpet, and the seller nor the buyer has the ability to put that carpet in, this could be a way to book in the, 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 the cost um, into the loan for the buyer if they don't mind paying just a little bit of extra money up front. The, the pain for you is if your buyer has something very difficult to do, like electrical needs to be redone or, or rerouting plumbing or kitchen lines, things like that, you have to get bids from contractors. And as the buyer's agent, it's your pleasure to go assist those contractors as they go into the house. So if you can't line up those contractors all in one day, you're driving to the house multiple times. That was my experience uh, with the one that I did probably about six or seven years ago. And I you know, probably went out there nine or 10 times to get three bids on three different projects um, for the buyer and the lender. And then you know, have to you know, make sure that the, lend the vendors that they chose had the proof for insurance and the, you know, permits were pulled for this wiring that needed to be done. It was just, it was just a lot of managing. And it's, it's not a big reward at the end of it. It's just, you know, you're, you're generally dealing with properties that are lower value. I'm not saying it's not a great loan to do for the right person. It's just not always the best option. So I very rarely will steer somebody in this direction um, if, uh, if I feel like their funds are tight themselves. Um, now, um, there is a streamlined loan. Um, Wells Fargo does this, and I think a couple other banks do this as well. And um, I think Wells, call, Wells Fargo calls it the 203 Express, or something like that, Streamline Express Loan. And it's the same kind of concept. The difference is they have a pre-approved list of contractors that are trained to look for FHA requirements. And it's kind of like nowadays how insurance companies, you wreck your car, you don't have to go get three bids, you just take it to their approved people and then whatever the bill is, they'll just pay it, right? They negotiate that on the back side. Same thing with this loan. They'll negotiate, that you'll pick whichever person you want to do the work. Uh, I think Home Depot is Wells Fargo's like stock, um, like where the vendors come from. But like I have a builder that's actually on Wells Fargo's list. Um, so to, to do any of the repairs, so they have a list of approved people, you pick one, and then whatever they say is, is what it is. And so the buyer, it's easier for you because you've just got one person that you're dealing with. We know that they're permitted, they're licensed, they, you know, they know what they're doing. Um, and it just saves you time, saves the buyer's time. But if the buyer's the type that they really want to pick over the bid and, well, I don't want to pay that much, then they're not going to be happy with it. I, I haven't seen it to be unfair, but it just doesn't give the buyer the choice to bid things out like they, like they normally would. Um, whatever they charge is what they charge. So there's some give and take to, to that loan. But it goes a little faster because of that. So, anyway. Okay, now we're going to talk about VA loans. Are you going to do the USDA? Okay, we're going to talk about USDA loans. <laughs> <laughs> wow. <laughs> Thank you. You're making me look bad on camera. No. <laughs> Turn it off. No, it's okay. Um, okay, USDA is also a government backed loan and it's actually the United States Department of Agriculture. And they are very interested in developing the rural areas of the country. You th I think the website's usda.gov and you can go onto that website and there is eligible areas that um, if your buyer buys a property in an eligible area, they don't have any down payment, and the PMI is drastically reduced. And from time to time, USDA will also do a discount on their PMI or eliminate it altogether. That might require a little higher upfront payment, but they run deals from time to time like that. So most, I mean, the majority of your um, community banks 
are um, USDA approved, like Pop Valley, your um, credit unions, most of them can work with USDA bank um, loans, um, Wells Fargo, most of your mainstream mortgage companies. But the criteria is based on census track, like how many people, what's the density of the population. And so right now, that if, if we're here in the Northland, and this is downtown, that line is about 135th-esque street, because it like the census tracks up there cut by the county, you know, country roads around the acreage tracks. So the line isn't exactly like it's right here. You know, it's kind of like it goes up to 42nd, 142nd, it goes down to 130th, and then it goes up to 150th. So you've got to really check if you're doing that Kearney, Liberty, Platte County area between 92 and 435, got to check it out. But typically, all of Smithville is good. So once you hit the nursery, you're good. Up in Smithville, off 169. Anything further north is fine, because it's all, you know, until you get to St. Joe. Um, Kearney just had a population shift, and the line cuts a little bit of the south part of Kearney out. So check the address on Kearney. If it's north, uh, you're probably fine. And then all of Excelsior, like then the line comes from Kearney and kind of makes a diagonal line um, as, because um, like Excelsior's over here. So almost all of Excelsior, you're good to go. Coming towards the Black County line, or Black County side, um, all of Platte City is good. Um, it hugs. Um, about Running Horse as it cuts down um, to 435, and then you got to be on this side of 435 for sure. And then as you get closer, then the line starts to kind of fade out. Um, I don't think anything like the Speedway area has has nothing that qualifies. Lansing doesn't qualify anymore. Leavenworth doesn't qualify. You have to be about two to three miles west. Of if you are working that side um, of Lansing, Ashland, Leavenworth, is that all, you know, or along Southern Highway, you have to be on the other side of it um, for, the, for that to, to work out. Like Tom, you would be okay. Um, but parts of, um, oh, Piper Baser area may or may not, just kind of depends. So. Anyway, and then this, um, as you go down on the Missouri side, uh, it, it's very, it's just to the east side of Seven Highway, as it cuts, you know, cuts across, if you go across the river and pick up Seven Highway, um, so like Buckner's good, Great Valley is still good, although that was at risk this year, but they did not end up cutting it out. Um, Blue Springs is not okay, but, but Great Valley is. And then it kind of goes right on down through Pleasant Hill and Harrisonville. You've got to be south of Peculiar, like Peculiar is okay, but you've got to be there or further south. So just to kind of give you an idea, you're working with people around the metro. So when you say okay, you mean eligible, eligible. potentially eligible. Potential eligible. And you can just go in and put in the address of a property and it'll tell you. It'll tell you. There is a map. Now the map takes a minute to load up. It'll actually show you good and bad based on color and you can like scroll in, but when you first get the map up, you're gonna be like, it doesn't say anything. I know, give it like five minutes, I mean, I'm not kidding. Give it like five minutes, it'll refresh eventually and then upload the colors and then you can kind of drill in and see it or there's an address finder, you can put in the address and it'll actually say this is eligible or this is not eligible, so it's kind of cool. And then if you have any other questions or something's really on the border, have the lender call USDA and verify that. So, now USDA will, does not like strapped, found, you know, like a manufactured home strapped on a foundation. Even though it's on a regular foundation, has a basement, if it's a manufactured home, it will not qualify USDA. They get a little picky about kind of that kind of housing. But pretty much, the house has to be in decent shape. You're not going to be able to do like a real distressed foreclosure. But the cool thing about USDA is that if there were to be, like I've done a foreclosure on USDA in Smithville. Um, if the, I think our appraisal came in like in the 120s, we were picking it up for about 108, I think. And the lender actually gave the, the buyer the option if he wanted to book in some carpet replacement 
or you know appliances, things that would be more like a two or three k loan, and they'll let you as long as the appraisal comes in, they'll let you borrow up to that amount and help you with the cash out on that or help you with the receipts, and it's easier than doing a two or three k loan. Now my buyer didn't actually take advantage of that; he didn't want to do that and add more to his loan amount, um, but it is an option. And I think then, then they do deals sometimes where you can book in the closing cost as well. But you have to be, you have to check with your lender before you make your buyer any promises on the stuff. Okay, so just check and see what their promotions are um, for that. Um, but that's a that's a pretty cool way to go. And there are also builders that will build in these areas and get pre-approval on USDA. Um, and there's some additional incentives sometimes when you work with that. Um, there's a builder that builds up in Meadow Lake in Smithville that will build to specifically USDA standards. There's extra insulation, just the way it's built, and you know types of construction materials that will pass their guidelines, and it's kind of a more streamlined process. So, USDA has their own uh, lender, uh, or I'm sorry, their own um, underwriting department. So you're going to go through your banks. So let's say I'm doing a deal with Flat Valley Bank, and um, their underwriter approves the loan. Well, then the loan package has to go to USDA and be approved by them. And they are sometimes up to a three week wait period to get through their process. They're a funny little bunch of people. They take so many Fridays off, um, every single glimmer of a holiday, and they take a week off at the end of every month just to like have a party. I don't know, but they do. <laughs> and so, and so, uh, so, you, so if you've got a deal that, you know, call your lender and ask them, How's the USDA wait period right now? Because like right now it's about seven to ten days, um, but I have had it be very, very extensive. And there's nothing you can do to push that data. I've tried. I've tried very hard to do it. Is that just a uh, residential? Does that include farms also? And then, um, no, that's right. And then the other thing is, uh, is there a cap? There is a limit on income, and there isn't a limit on. Um, I think there's a limit on land. There, there are some rules about acreage. Um, I know FHA has rules like that too, where if you like, if you say you're buying a tract of land that's like 80 acres big, and if it has the potential to be broken off into pieces, um, they don't like that. So they don't want you to take the government money and then go make money on their money. <laughs> they want to do that. So there are some rules, and so if you get into bigger pieces of land, like you know five, ten acres, I, again, I would just talk to your lender, let make sure they know, have them look up the, the the plot and county records, and just make sure that it approves. Again, you guys don't have to be the expert of this stuff. Like I'm not, I'm not the expert of this. I just know, hmm, let's go check that out. Like that's you know that's your script. So don't be intimidated. Like oh, I don't know the rules. I don't know what the income limits are. I don't know. Don't you know? Don't try not to worry about that. And just focus on, hey, Mr. Buyer, there might be this great loan. If we buy the right piece of property, we get you no know, money down. Wouldn't that be great? You know. And so try to to work that in. So that's your hook. To get them in. All right. VA. Wouldn't that be good? VA is good. Yeah, we can talk about that. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. All right. She's keeping us on track. Okay. VA loans is also government-backed loans, um, obviously for our veterans that have served. Um, there are different what the what, the, what happens is when they are looking to purchase a home, they are able to get a letter of entitlement from the service. Especially if they are being discharged, they will be told what their benefits are. And one of them will be an entitlement to do a VA loan. You can only hold one VA loan at a time. So if they have a house somewhere and they get transferred, they can't do another VA loan. They'd have to sell or refinance the first house if they want to repurchase with a VA loan. And there can also be different levels of entitlement for, for the veteran. So if somebody served and was you know, hurt, um, dismembered, they you know, served for a very long time, they may have a different entitlement level that they get just a little bit more perks out of the loan than maybe somebody with a basic um, entitlement. But the typical entitlements that are available is that it is 100% financing, so there's no money down. And then the PMI and interest rates can also be varied based on their level of entitlement. And sometimes the closing costs can also be controlled. I actually had a gal that was disabled um, working in the Navy, 
remember what brand, I think she was in the Navy, but whatever her job was required her, it was loading like weapons. And so she, like from picking up and lifting, had damaged her um, back and hip very severely and had, you know, she was on disability um, through that. So she had like her launch, like her closer costs were very minimal. It was pretty, you know, she got a great interest rate, and money down, great PMI rate, all of that. So that is, if you want to, um, if you have somebody that says they want to do a VA loan, if all you say is, do you have your entitlement letter, they should know what that means. If you get to somebody that doesn't know what that means, then they may not be eligible to do a VA loan. That would be my first hint. But you know what? Let's get you to a lender and have them verify. Because even if they don't have the entitlement letter, they should have a office where they can go get that. Um, they just might need a refresher on what it is that they're supposed to do. So I just did a deal some, with somebody that had retired from the military like 20 some years ago and never done, never taken advantage of the VA loan, and they just, they wanted to at this time. So it's kind of interesting. Um, also, just like FHA, VA has their own appraisal process. <sighs> and it's like the FHA where the house has to meet certain standards, habitable standards. And their appraisers get 10 business days to perform the appraisal, and my experience is they're not very good at that. They will generally blow their timelines. So if you're doing a deal, writing up a VA loan, my best practice is give yourself 60 days to close that loan. It can be done in 30, it, you know, it can be done, but I, if you get the wrong appraiser that drags the process down, I've had three deals in the last four or five years that the appraiser is the one that kept it from closing on time. So, okay, first time buyer grant loans. The one of the very most easiest ones is MHTC. And what the state of Missouri does is they take money out of the treasury and they put it aside to promote home ownership in our state to, to first time buyers or buyers are deemed first time if they haven't been on a deed of a, of a home for three full years. So somebody could have owned a home in 2004, sold it, now you know they've been renting for 10 years, they could qualify as a first time buyer and if they fit inside the, the box and they could qualify for a down payment assistance grant. What that grant is, is a 3% down payment. It doesn't write very dark. 3% down payment gift. The buyer has to bring in 0.5%. Together, that's an FHA 3.5% down loan. Make sense? Yes. Do they? Um, I haven't been on these for a long time. Huh? Um, they used to have an option if they wanted to put. They could either go to lower interest rate, or they could get that more of the gift. Yes. They have um, what's called a, I think a guaranteed loan, and that's if the buyer has their own down payment money. There is a special lower interest rate that is reserved. For, uh, for that buyer, so, and you have to check because sometimes it's not a deal. Um, it depends on if the market's up or down, because what happens is the state of Missouri every three to six months will put this money away and then set terms on it. So let's say six months ago, the interest rates were sitting at 4.4. Uh, today, 4.4, then eh, you can probably get an FHA loan from 4.1 or 4.2. So unless your buyer really needs the cash funds, it may not be a deal. Um, it, it generally will have a higher interest rate because they're giving you money. I mean, anytime you get something, you're going to pay for it somewhere, and that's how they, they technically get it back. So the uh, you know, so check it before you you know because I've had people get qualified for it, but then realize, oh my gosh, it's 4.8. I could get 4.2. Why would I do that? You know. So 
<clears throat> but if they don't have the down payment funds and they want to get them in a house and they want to get into a house, it, it can be a great way to get somebody in a home that otherwise couldn't. They can, it can get you a couple extra deals. It can we all use a couple extra three or four grand here and there? No, my kid. You guys can give it to me if you don't need it. Um, I'll work them. Okay, so that's how that works. Um, they have a qualification box. This is the best way I've found to describe it to a buyer where you have to make enough money to qualify, but you can't make too much money because God forbid if you were making you know, 80 grand, you can probably afford to pay your own down payment, hopefully. So they're not looking to give money to just everybody. But the box is fairly large. I mean, for your average first time buyer, they're probably gonna fit in the box for the most part. There is a debt to income ratio and a credit standard as well. So you've got income, credit standard, and the price of the house, I think, is about 170 max. It's right in there for how much of a home they can actually buy. Doesn't that depend on the area too? Because do they have a, a map that you go to? They have a yeah. They have a well. It used to be that way. I don't know if they have a map. On, well, they might for the total price of house. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Then. Um, that's your MHDC. Only certain lenders are going to do that. So make sure you're working with a qualified lender that can do that type of loan. Again, most of your community banks do these kind of things. Okay, the next one is KC Dream, which is right now a revamped, I uh, just got something in the, my email a couple days ago about this, and I don't remember what they're calling it, but it's not exactly KC Dream, but it's kind of KC Dream. But the government has released some down payment funds that the cities can use. Bless you. And as long as the house is in the city of Kansas City, Missouri, your buyer could get approved to get a grant of up to, I think it's $15,000 right now. Now, KC Dream traditionally kind of changes their rules every year about what they do. It used to be a flat 20% or $20,000, uh, whatever is um, larger, no, whatever is smaller, um, grant that they would get as a down payment gift. Then it used to be, a little history here, that Vivian in the Northland, the only way you could get a KC Dream loan is if you were south of Vivian, approximately. They had a little zone. And so subdivisions like Crestview and you know all of that, all that Carbon Road corridor, Holiday Hills, um, Gracemore thrived because if a buyer wanted 20 grand down payment for free, you know, go buy your first time home, live there for 10 years, that money is yours. So once you've lived there for 10 years, you do not have to pay any part of that down payment back. That equity is yours. So because I like simple math. If you buy a $100,000 home, you would get a $20,000 down payment gift. Your loan is based off of 80. So that makes the payment cheaper. So over 10 years, maybe I pay that loan, you know, I pay the loan down to maybe 60. Hopefully, if the you know, market goes up, let's just, let's just say the house is worth 110, the difference all goes to your buyer. So they get that 20000 back in equity to use on the next house so they can cash out, pay taxes on it, whatever they're doing. Can you do that conventional or FHA? Is it limited? It used to be that you could, and now it's limited to that it is an FHA product. Um, so you are going to have a financing fee and you are going to have PMI. One of the very first Kansas City Dream deals I did, um, they actually had some of their own down payment funds and even supplemented the down payment and got out of their PMI hundred, you know, completely. Um, but that is not possible. We have to, and now FHA loans, you have PMI for the life of the loan. Um, so that's how it works. Well, then when the market kind of crashed, Kansas City said, you know what, we don't care. We're going to take away the zones, and anywhere KCMO address works. So now we have the whole Northland to work with. So then that kind of 
then drove the market away from being cornered down here, and these subdivisions really started to suffer because of it. So then the city, about two years ago, went back to zones. All of Kansas City qualifies, but you get more money based on what zone you're in. I think they've got it split up in seven or eight zones. Obviously, if you're going urban core, there's a better advantage. And you blighted area. Yeah, anything that's truly blighted. And they also have incentives for developers to go in and build up those areas. And if you get people approved on the dream loan, they get discounts on the price, plus you know, down payment grants are higher, and, and they, they really get carte blanche. Uh, Tab had one a couple years ago where this, like right off of like Swift Parkway, off of 71, there's a neighborhood probably about Agnes and like 70th Street. And this developer builder guy just went in and bought up a bunch of old lighted lots, knocked everything down and rebuilt. And they got a $30,000 grant on like a $90,000 home. It was like amazing. They got some of the closing costs taken care of through this grant um, because they didn't—they weren't required to use all of the money. You can put some of it back towards the closing cost if you don't want it down against the down payment. So uh, they were just pretty much wrote their own check. Just got to live down there if that's what you like. So anyway, so again, this KC Dream product um, morphs and changes. So it is kind of one of those liquid targets that you can't always guarantee what the amounts are. And I will tell you that the box for Kansas City Dream is a smaller than the box for MHDC. So the income limits are typically around 42,000 for a single person. If you have a second person in your home, you get a little bit more money. It's like 44, 45. If you have a third, you know, so if you've got two people and a kid, then you might be able to make 50, 52. And then, you know, it goes up from there the more people you have in the home. However, any income, that any one person makes in the house has to be counted towards the total salary. So it's not like you can just take, you know, well, dad's gonna buy the house and he's gonna be the one on the mortgage. You know, he makes, you know, 35 grand and we're just not gonna put the wife on the mortgage. If the wife, wife makes, you know, 45 grand, you can't eliminate her from the loan. They're gonna look at the income. She may not be on the loan, but her income counts. Same thing if you have a live-in parent something like that, or if you are a, you know, a remarriage family, maybe kid or wife gets alimony payments or a child support check, that all counts in towards that income. So you have to kind of be careful that usually, it's not that most people won't qualify in the income, it's usually, or it's the income that keeps them from qualifying. Um, it's not necessarily the credit or the other criteria. And also, max loan on these uh, has been around 140000 so you just have a smaller segment of the market that these loans will work for, and then you're limiting their income. Kansas City Dream also looks at debt to income very carefully, um, very carefully, and they will research to make sure that the total income reported matches. I had a gal uh, a couple years ago that received a stipend from a trust fund. She got a, a monthly check, and some of that, the check was had something to do with the stock market, you know, if so, because it was based on how much money she gained. Um, I think they were just bleeding off, like the base was there and they, she was just bleeding off whatever they made that month, you know, in stock gains. And because it was a, also a moving target, it was really close. Um, they counted all of that and they had to go back and average it out. It was this huge formula and it took us like 90 days to close because Kansas City Dream was really looking at this account and scouring, you know, what were, was her true income? Was there anything else she was hiding? And they, you know, went up and did, I'm sure they did a social security search and, you know, just looked at what, looked at her tax records and her income bank statements and stuff like that, so. When you, when you say it morphs, or it's a liquid target, mm -hmm. do they change to periodically during the year or do they just change yes. during the year they do? Yeah, it depends. Um, it used to be quarterly that they would release money and now I think with the city budget just being a little bit down, they haven't released as much funds, so it's been about once every six months. But then this, like the last funds dried up very quickly. They released in February and they were done by April, May even. And so then all of a sudden out of nowhere, I, I get this email from, you know, that my gal that does these loans and she's like, hey, this is, this is on, I'm calling, you know, I've got a buyer that missed out, they just missed out, like they got him approved. I'm like, okay, let's go shopping. And then it's like, no, <laughs> money's gone. It's like, crap. So uh, you, uh, you just gotta get in relationship with the lender and again, you don't have to know 100% of this. 
just know that the product exists. This is just so when you're in an open house and you've got a buyer, if you're in the right price open house, right? You're going to go to a half a million dollar open house. And go, hey, you want a first time buyer? <laughs> okay, but if you're, you know, you're in a hundred and fifty to two hundred thousand dollar house that might go USDA or one of the grant loans, um, you know, this is a nice hook, right? So to say, hey, you know, are you first time buyer grants? You know that there are still some some first time buyer grants out there that can help you with your down payment if you want. Um, has anybody talked to you about that? Great. You want to stop by my office? I'll be happy to tell you about it, right? And again, all when they get there, all you're going to do is say, hey, great, here's my lender, right? And here's my buyer agency. Let me tell you about that, right? So it's your hook. It's your way to get people interested that you have knowledge that they need. And even if it's just, I have the knowledge, but you really need to go talk to her. You're still helping them, right? You're still so, so try not to get overzealous about again about all the details here. Just know the stuff's out there. Okay. Sometimes it's better just to inform them because right. they, they have no idea. Because nobody else is doing it. Right. So you might as well. KCK, City of Independence. Sometimes you'll find that other little cities also have little programs like the Dream Loan. KCK calls it the chip, and then they have something called a super chip. And uh, you definitely have to go to specific banks on the KCK side. Um, Liber Bank, Liberty Bank is one that does, that works for the city on, on these loans. Bank Liberty. Bank Liberty. Bank Liberty. Okay. Well, there's Bank Liberty and there's, there's a different version on the Kansas side. So it's not like Bank Liberty up here. Um, bank of Liberty. Liberty of Bank. I don't know. Something like that. <laughs> uh, and they will help you, help your buyer with that. Very similar to KC Dream, they do 20% gift. Um, you can borrow funds from the 20% to do down payment or uh, closing cost if the buyer chooses instead of a full 20% down payment. Super chip is when a developer goes in, pre-develops or pre-approves a flip house. Has to be in a tighter. Um, they also have a map, and it has to be in a tighter area. Um, the, so the zone is more like a central downtown piece of the is What you get is a 50% discount on the price of the house. You said it was a developer. It can't be a um, private. It person. could be if they get pre-approved. Like you could have a flipper that gets pre-approved to take a, an old house and flip it. But it's an investment. And if they go first to the city and say, can I get this on the super chip list? Okay. Um, they actually publish uh, something on their website that says these are pre-approved houses that qualify for the special program. Okay. And if your buyer qualifies for that particular program, it's a, they get a discount on the cost of the house as long, along with the down payment. So it's like free. I don't mean it's not free, but it's like free. Five dollars. <laughs> it's a pretty good deal. Uh, again, you have to want to live in that urban core, but you know, hey, it's out there. Okay. And, well, do they have to live in it, or can they flip it? No, all of these loans, though, when you're getting free money, okay, wait, wait. The developer that pre-approves themselves for the super chip doesn't have to live in it, but the end buyer does. Okay. So all of these grant programs require that the, that the buyer be an owner occupant in the house. Typically, Five to seven years, it can be 10 on Kansas City Dream. And if for any reason the buyer had to move out, um, so let's say we take our $100,000 house and they get a grant loan of $20,000, they owe 80 for the mortgage, and say they live there for five years. So the, the money that they took at $20,000 would just be prorated. So at five years, that's easy. It's $10,000. So they can keep half, but then they'll have to pay back the loan or the gift, if you will, when they sell. Now, that gift should hopefully be in the price of the house, right? Because if they only owe 80 and they've made a few payments, you, even if the house didn't improve in value, you could still sell it for 100 and they'd have money, equity, to pay off the Kansas City Dream program to pay it back. But they still got the 10 grand benefit. Okay. Good. I have a question. Yes. So they live there, they're, they're full term, five, seven, ten years. When they go to sell it, do they have to pay income tax on the grant money they receive? I mean, That's, since it's a, it was, I mean, is it a grant or a gift? I didn't know. It's a gift, yeah. but it is, but they have to live there for a certain time. Did I not follow your question? No, I don't think so. Okay, say it again. So, 
they got the 20000 as a gift. They live their, their full term, seven years. Uh -huh. When they go to sell their house, they you know they, they paid 100 but they really paid 80 They sold it for 100 so they're really just, at, when it's all said and done, they're just pocketing a, a gift. Oh, I see. Did they pay, have to pay on that because it's income? I don't they, know the answer to that question. Okay. And I would say you probably need to talk to a tax accountant. You are not one, and <laughs> unless you are. <laughs> there is an agent in our office that is one. <laughs> so um, his name is <laughs> something, <laughs> something, something CPA. Um, yeah. <laughs> Mike Roloff. Mike Roloff. Okay. Uh, next page or no down. Next is how might you line of credit. These are often called HELOC, so if you hear the term HELOC, that was its home equity line of credit. For anybody out there that doesn't know that. Okay, home line of credit works like this. You're actually getting two loans against the house. I'm going to give you a really good example. I did a short sale two years ago, a house easily worth $150, maybe even a little bit more when it was done. It was built in the 70s and nothing had been updated since. I mean, it was like maybe some carpet in the 80s, but, <laughs> but it was pretty much, you know, just the way it was. And it was in good shape. It just was really, really ugly. Um, price of the short sale was um, uh, 105, and that's what we bid. And we wait the short sale out. In the meantime, my buyer starts investigating. Okay, look, we've got to replace the kitchen cabinets. We've got to get some carpet. We got it. The bathrooms need to be done. We get a, a remodeler over there. Get him a bid, and bill is yeah, anywhere from sixteen to twenty grand for the you know for what they want the builder remodeler to do. So we uh, start looking at two or three k loan options, and they are very anti don't like paying the double appraisal, the double, you know, uh, inspection fees, things like that. And the interest rate was higher and they were very driven not to do that. So I said, hey, you know, what if we did home marketing line of credit? I wonder if we could get, you know, a, the bank or the mortgage company to advance you the 16 grand off of the expected improvement equity that you're going to have in the home once it's done. Because if you can make the home look like all the rest of them have been updated, that sold for 145 to 160, you know, I think that would make sense. So that's what they did. They went to um, to their bank, and they were able to to do that. So they closed the deal, and at the same time that they closed their loan, they also got another loan with a kind of a checkbook control, if you will, credit card esque feeling, where they could go and take money up to sixteen thousand dollars. For home improvements on the house. As soon as they start borrowing money, it was interest only for so many years. I think it was three. And then their payments would go up, you know, as they started making payments down on that, on, um, or to, to, to buy down the balance. Um, their goal was to try to have it paid off in three years because it's almost kind of like a small car payment, you know, for some people. And, and so that they thought they could handle that. Um, so we, that's how we did it, and it worked out really great, and then they had control of that money. It wasn't like with the 203K where you're tied in to you know, having to use other contractors. They could do some of the work themselves. They could go to Home Depot when they felt like it, and, you know, and then they would just pay their credit cards off with this line of credit um, as they did the repairs up to this amount. Now, they did have to pay for two appraisals because the bank has to come in and do a, a second appraisal for how much is the house going to be worth after they do the list of things that they intend to do with the money. And the bank did sort of control to make sure that that was being done. I think they handled it not quite like a draw, but they wanted, you know, receipts turned in. They just, you know, kind of wanted some control. And they only ended up using, I think, like 10, 12 grand at the end of the day. So they actually saved a little bit of money of what they anticipated. But after they pay this off, the 16 grand is like a, a credit card against the house, and they can draw on it for up to 10 years. So if they pay that off, the 12 grand they use off, and they want to do the roof or you know do more of a remodel to one of the bathrooms or you know add on or something, they've got that line of credit that they can use in the future. 
So that's just another way to do it. Now, if you do have two loans, that means two payments, and your home equity line of credit is always going to have a higher interest rate than your first mortgage. So just be prepared for that. doing adjustable rates. What that means is that you're committing that the mortgage will be based off of an interest rate for so many years and then after that the interest rate goes up. Nowadays adjustable rates have a cap on how they can adjust up, sometimes a limit over life of loan. But 10 years ago when I got into real estate it was very common to do no money down, adjustable rate mortgage, and if 6% was the average rate at the time, then you could get 5.5 if you did this in this awesome adjustable mortgage and it would make your payment cheaper up front. And so as we know, the end of that story didn't really go well for anybody. But there are times when maybe an adjustable makes sense, and that would be if you're working with somebody that has the intention and the ability to pay off that home within the adjustable period. So let's say you have somebody that maybe has a lot of equity in the house that they're going to buy. Um, they've sold a house that they owned outright, or maybe they're buying a villa, or they're moving up or moving down. But they want to take a small mortgage, you know, of maybe 50, 60 grand, and to get the better interest rate up front, they'll take an adjustable rate mortgage to make that payment lower with the intention that within 10 years they're going to have it paid off anyway, even if the rate goes up, they're just gambling that it's not going to go up high enough to make the benefit of getting a cheaper rate up front not worth it. Um, I once worked with an attorney that had $150,000 equity in the house. He bought a $300,000 house, he had a $150,000 mortgage, and he did a three-year adjustable and got like 2.5% interest rate on it. And I was like, what are you doing? And he's like, I don't know, you don't understand, in my, in my firm, we get end of year bonuses based on profit and you know work that they put in. He goes, I'll have this paid off in three years by using just that bonus. And I was like, oh, okay, great, <laughs> super. <laughs> so you know those are examples of when that might make sense. But if you just have your average first time buyers probably gonna you know resell or stay in the house for a while and maybe not resell it right away, and that's a known fact. That would be another reason that maybe an adjustable might make sense if you know you're only going to be there for so long and then you're going to sell out. Although some of them have prepayment penalties, so you got to watch that too. But it could make sense. Um, again, you don't have to be the expert of exactly when it makes sense, but just know that these are options. You have a buyer ask you, that's the good and the bad. Buying down points. Okay, so let's say I've got a $200,000 house. That's the loan amount. And I'm being offered a 5% interest rate, just for grins. The buyer has the option of paying down a point of the mortgage and typically will be offered 0.25% discount on the interest rate. A point is what? Who remembers that from real estate school? Usually 1%. A percentage. All right. Excellent. So that would be $2,000. Is everybody cool with my math? So one point is $2,000. And for that point, I will get a quarter point discount, which means now I've bought down my interest rate to 4.75. In the 80s, this is how they had to sell houses because interest rates were 14 to 20%, depending on the area of the country. So to make a payment affordable, sellers would often pay points. They'd buy points down for the buyer. Not really needed in our market. Uh, the only time I would even recommend that to a client, I actually just recommended it to one yesterday. They're buying their IT home. That's the long haul house. They have a large down payment. They have some cash on hand, they're not strapped. And so spending three to six grand to buy their interest rate down a half a point actually makes sense 
because over a life of loan it will save them thousands and thousands and thousands of tens of thousands of dollars because they're because of the amount of mortgage that that they are getting that's when that rate chart that I always refer to helps you I know, everybody's like thumb drive darn it <laughs> will help you because then you can see the difference in how the interest rate affects wow. the life of loan interest paid and their payment. But for the average buyer that plans to live in the home for six to 10 years max, I wouldn't recommend it as long as they're getting a fair interest rate, which in my personal opinion, if it's under six, it's fair. <laughs> it's just, you know, we, we've been very blessed um, to have great interest rates. So that's how it works, just so you guys know. I know lenders sometimes will do deals on, you know, point for point or half point, I haven't seen anybody do that because they don't need to right now. Okay, that leaves us with owner financing, lease purchases, favorite topics, not. Okay, owner financing is often used when your seller has the home that they are selling owned free and clear, and the buyer who wants to buy the home could technically be approved by a mortgage company, but usually this is used when the buyer cannot get approved. And the seller is willing to actually become the mortgage company, set up a mortgage payment schedule and then the buyer makes the payment to the seller. There is actually a closing, the deed is changed hands, and then the seller will place a lien, just like a mortgage company would, on the house, that if the buyer doesn't make their payments, they have foreclosure rights to foreclose and take back the house. For your average seller out there, this is not an option, because they need the cash out of that home. They need the buyer to pay for the house so they can get out and go do the next thing. But occasionally, if you have an investor, um, that's you know been hanging on to a rental and they want to sell it and it's paid off and you've got a buyer that really wants it maybe has some money up front as a down payment typically down payments are higher than, t than standard most sellers are going to want probably about a 10% down payment that's not saying I mean, they can sell whatever terms they want but typically this is what these guys would, would like to have and then the interest rate is going to be higher but it just kind of depends on what they're doing with their money because sometimes 4% is better than no percent or 1%, which is what they're making in a savings account. So it kind of depends on the price of the house, how much, and the terms. Typically, when you do an owner finance, you're going to write it. If there is a standard form in KCRER. You don't have to reinvent this wheel. It's already there for you. Uh, but it's going to have a balloon written in. And what that means is that they'll allow the buyer to owner finance for a period of time, but then it's going to stop. And then the buyer has to pay off the house or refinance it. So if you have a buyer that just maybe just needs to get over something, you know, pay off the debt, do something, this is a way to do a cleaner lease purchase. <laughs> I mean, but they really own the home. I mean, it's true of home ownership. And, and, and you get paid because there is a closing. Now, the thing you have to remember is that the seller may not feel like paying your commission out of his own pocket. So to make these deals work, the seller is usually going to want the buyer to bring enough down payment that it covers both agents' commissions, closing costs, anything that the buyer needs help with, plus their own costs to do with the deal, which is why typically 10% is what's required to cover that, because you've got 6% wrapped up in commissions typically. So, and they'll want to put a little cash in their pocket. Um, that worked really well for me. I've got a, a, a deal that I did as an owner finance, and um, the people were transferred here with GM, they had just been through a bankruptcy, they did not qualify, and they were the type of people that they had two huge dogs, they weren't going to make it in an apartment, and I had, my investor had this little kind of rinky dinky house, and uh, it was paid off, and an agent in our office knew that I had this thing, and they came to me and said, hey, would your seller be willing to do owner financing? I'm like, I don't know, let me ask him. And he's like, oh yeah, he goes, I, don't know, I won't make 5% on that money anywhere else, let's just do it up, you know? So. The buyer put down, I think, like eight grand, and it was like a twenty-five thousand. Wasn't it? Really, is a twenty-five thousand dollars house in Northland that you can live in, and <laughs> it, was, it was actually not that bad. Um, I would have lived in it if I had to, um, and it it was a cute little house. It's just like a hundred and some years old on a foundation. North Winnetonka up on the hill. 
And actually, it's on the market right now. I have it. I have it under contract because those people are getting transferred back, and um, they need to sell it. And so they called me, and um, so we're selling it again. Except they tore it apart and didn't put the walls back. So they were starting to rehab it, and um, and then they got he got hurt on the job, and then they're, now they're transferring back. But anyway, long story. But, however, my seller had, you know, received money from them. Um, they set it up on a five-year loan, and they actually almost have the house paid off. They, they only owe just a few thousand dollars on it. And um, when they sell it, then he'll get his money back. So it actually worked out great for him, and he made some money on that money that he wouldn't have made in a savings account, you know, or he would have had to take a risk on it. So it doesn't work for everybody. And, and if your seller owes money against the house, your first lien holder, you know, whoever has the mortgage, is not going to allow a second mortgage to be posted on that house. Or, you know, they're going to be very unhappy about that later on down if they find out. So it's not an option if there is a mortgage on the house, unless you have first lien holder approval. Okay, that brings me to Lee's purchase. Just don't do it. <laughs> <laughs> What happens is typically it's a buyer that does cannot get their financing and they say they'll come to you as the listing agent and say, Hey, you know, I've just got to clean up my credit, it's gonna take me six months. I love this house, I really love it. And I, you know, we just want to lease it for six months and then I will then we'll buy it. And so you draw up this paperwork and to lease it for so much time, and there's an upfront payment, and nine times out of ten, they don't fix their credit. They don't make the payments on time, and they walk away. The house is trashed. Your seller's in a, in a bigger mess than they were, and it's and you don't get paid. And you usually have to go testify in court because there's usually sue a judgment somewhere in there for you know carpet damages or house damages, or sometimes it's the other way around and the buyer's mad at the seller, and it just doesn't always work out. The holes in, the, in that is that the buyer gets to live in the house and they have kind of quasi ownership of it typically per our lease purchase contracts. It's their responsibility to do the maintenance. But if something goes wrong, there's a roof leak, there's a problem with the furnace, the buyer can get mad about that and that will slander them in wanting to go ahead and complete the purchase. So they'll be more willing to walk away from something because they're scared of it. So it's not a concrete sell. You can write into the terms of the lease purchase that the seller pay the agents a part or all of the commission up front, but many sellers are unwilling to do that. And it's just, I don't know, Gayla has got two deals that she's been, one of them, I think they're still in small claims court going back and forth on some stuff. And every once in a while she'll have to go testify or present documents, it's just crazy. So it's, it's a mess. And I know Bill says that the majority of them that get written by our office it's like less than a 1% chance that it will actually close. So a script handler for that is, you know, Trey, <laughs> Tanya, I know you really want that house, and I totally understand, but as a buyer, you know, you're not going to be able to afford, um, you know, buying the house right now because of your credit, and because of that inconvenience, if we go with a lease purchase option with the seller, they are going to insist that you give them a huge down payment, and they're not gonna give you a discount on the price or pay any cost for you. And then when it comes time to close, you're gonna have to pay the closing costs again. You're gonna have another upfront money you know, requirement, maybe additional down payment, and it's just not gonna be a really good deal. Don't you think it would make more sense to rent for six or 12 months, even if it's a rental house, or it's just something where it's, it's, it's not a tied in agreement to, to making a purchase, we get you approved, and then we go in and we do some negotiating with the seller because now you're a true buyer that can close the deal and, and get a better get an interest rate, better house, better better situation. Does this not sound better? Definitely. Better. Yes. <laughs> of course it does. Of course it does. Okay, so so that's that's how you're gonna kind of script out of that when you get that buyer call that really wants to suck up your time um, looking for lease purchases. Now there are occasions when that might make sense and usually they have to be happy stories. So I just got a job transfer um, until our house sells here, we can't buy, but we really gotta be in a house and we love this house and we just need three to six months to just get our house under contract. Like something like that where it's not a negative thing. I mean, it's still a little risky, but at least you've got a chance there. Um, I've also done one 
where during the tax credit years when the government would give you a tax credit on your income tax, um, you had to not be on a deed for three years. And the buyer had been divorced and thought that when his wife refinanced or something had happened, it happened at a certain date, but it didn't. He needed three more months because his name didn't come off the deed until then. So if he closed, he wouldn't qualify for the tax credit. So we did a lease purchase for him and he made payments to my seller. The lender was copied in on all of those payments, a certain portion of it we agreed to allow to go as a credit towards down payment. The lender was on board with that. Three months later, we closed, but he had already moved in and taken possession of the house because his lease was up and he had to get out and he didn't want to resign. And he didn't really have a lot of options. So that worked out. But again, it wasn't a negative, a negative problem with the buyer's credit or ability to buy. It was just, hey, I just can't get this incentive if you can just work with me. And so the seller was okay with that. In that situation, they were fine with it. Anyway, but overall, kind of a risky deal and not always worth your time. All right, so that pretty much wraps it up. And I'd be happy to take any questions from anyone. I got one uh, about owner financing. Mm -hmm. um, so in the, the beginning stage of owner financing, it's, the house is already deed in their name, correct? Or is that? Yes, there is a closing. There is a true closing where the title transfers. Uh -huh. And then the owner, so let's say you own a house at 1234 Main Street, and, and I'm going to buy it, okay? And you're going to finance my loan for me. So I actually go in to the title company, I sign papers, I get a deed with my name on it, you give me title insurance, the whole nine yards. But simultaneously, you're going to record a lien that you are the lien holder of that home, just like a mortgage company yeah. would be. Um, so you don't technically own the home, you're not responsible for it in any way, but you own the debt against it. So if I stop making my payments to you, you could foreclose on me so, and get the house back. Like, like if I was to foreclose on you, would it just come back to me naturally or would I have to go over like... Oh, you'll have to go do some stuff. Five. Yeah. Three, yeah. Okay. Yeah, you gotta that's, call that's people. I was, I was thinking like, you know, you buy your house, like you know, you have a year to buy your house back on tax debt. I didn't know if there was some stipulation, stipulation like that inside of the owner financing. Yeah, man, I know you're not a lawyer, or you know. I had a, actually, I had the same owner finance guy that I was just telling you about yeah. had done an owner finance back in 1980. Nine, okay. and it was this little house in Pleasant Valley, and it was like they only owed probably two grand on the house, and they lived there for years and years, and something had happened, and they just quit making their payments. I think one went in the hospital. I don't remember the whole thing, but he foreclosed on them, and he talked to an attorney, and uh, it took some time. They had to make a recording. The sheriff had to come out, you know, just like normal, um, but he was able to execute the foreclosure and get the house back. So. He had the benefit of receiving almost all of that money that he sold that house for. Get the house back. Now I'm telling you when the house came back, it was not in good shape. But he was able to resell it for a profit and made more money on his money, basically. So, um, yeah. Other questions? That's a good one. Oh, uh, this FHA doesn't, they don't do, they don't release your PMI at 80% anymore? No. They're straight across the board. It doesn't all matter. Day, one day, yeah. Done. They want their money. Yeah. When did that change? Recently? About six months ago. Maybe at the first of the year or right before. So, so like when I bought my house, I bought it at AJ for some reason. Um, they were they were still doing it. You know, they'll drop it eight percent. So like, mm -hmm. my grandfather DM can they mm -hmm. they'll still release it. When yeah, because it's written into your terms what yeah. your terms are. Right. They can't change that. But on new loans moving forward, that's what they can change. That is good information. It's like a government loan. As long as they meet the minimum credit, it's good. But there's no incentive if you have stellar credit versus if you just meet the minimum. Um, on, the, on the VA, uh, you didn't talk about the funding fee. It depends if it's a first time buy or. Yes, yes, the, yes. The VA um, the lending fee depends on a couple things. That it can depend on entitlement, and then how, yes, if they bought a house through VA before, there's a fee up front that kind of passes as the PMI, um, if you will, that gets either added into the loan or they can pay it up front. 
but the seller cannot actually pay that fee. They, they call that the funding fee? A funding what, fee. What about how much is the, the funding fee used? It can be anywhere from 1% to 4% of the mortgage, just depending on their situation and entitlement. And VA, I think it's buy up to 417 I don't know. Okay. I've never had the occasion to work with a veteran that like that was had a good price point like that. I, I know you I know you can spend over three hundred in Arkansas. Sure, yeah, like, yeah, yeah, it's all based on cost of living. Yeah. Um, is how they do it. So it could very well be. That's true. Very well be. I was like my gut check would have been had you not said that probably mirrors FHA, but that's it's not to say it's higher than FHA. Is it okay? Yeah. But like an FHA loan in California, you can do up to like a hundred thousand dollar loan. That's only two bedroom though. Right. <laughs> yeah, right. Yes, it's because of this table. <laughs> okay. All right, guys. Well, have a great day. I hope Thank this you. helped. Thank you. Okay. Thank you.